Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry, high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. All right, you guys have been liking the Hakeem coverage, so we got another one for you. It's called Former Socialism's Faults. And it'll be good to see from Hakeem, who's a socialist, his perspective of the, you know, history of failures. All right, original video is linked down below. Let's get started. All right, the comment sections have been lively with this, so thank you for being for respectful for uh, to each other. But um, I really encourage your comments. What do you think of his analysis here? And it gets a little sticky, I know, because a lot of it is, you know, people using different definitions of all the ism words, and that becomes a little bit difficult. Um, but what do you think of the analysis and the history that, you know, being discussed here? So uh, anyways, keep that up. Thank you. Hello. Hello. In this video, I'll be discussing some of the Hello. issues and errors of previous attempts at building socialism. Okay. We also have a dedicated episode on our podcast that you program to just this, so check that out too. Okay, I think I was like told about this there's some other guys that kind of run in that same circle with with the team and that i should um maybe cover i haven't seen you ever done any other or cover these other guys um one of them i, th I think was named second thought as uh, uh, they were saying some people were saying that i should probably cover some of those videos um if you want me to let me know down below this will span many different nations and time periods in order to cover as many interesting points as Great. possible, as briefly as possible. Great. Of course, I'll be providing a little context to faults when I can, as they didn't occur in a vacuum, and almost all of them happened as a direct reaction to impending threats or serious difficulties that Correct. were near impossible to overcome at the time. Correct. Every socialist movement was built upon the back of a hard time before. Never Things were never great, and then... All of a sudden, there was some socialist revolution. And that was actually a big thesis I kind of took home with uh, the last video I covered, not on Hakeem, but on Metatron, who was talking about how, um, like the Nazi party, were they, you know, left or right? And using these different definitions of, of like socialism, but um, having, you, you have to compare it to what the time was before in that place and time where socialism, um, you know, is, is, is really becoming... Um, something advocated for. That's how you have to do it. This is by no means an exhaustive list. These are just quick examples of faults that can be learned from. Likewise, this is not an attempt at excusing genuine faults that should be rightfully condemned, critiqued, studied, and learned from. Let's get started. So you can do some Gorbachev competition stuff. in relevant spheres with the West. This is one of the earliest faults in my mind. This point applies more to the USSR than smaller socialist countries, but nonetheless, Don't it's still a mistake. The USSR started from a position similar to that of Brazil or the Arab region. For it to get from a semi-feudal backwater to a spacefaring superpower in a few decades is incredibly impressive and a testament to the potential of planned economies. Nonetheless, the USSR was more or less forced into framing itself as the alternative to specifically American capitalism. Well, what I've heard people say with that is like, yes, the Soviet Union, you know, achieved those things, but was the cost worth it? Because they put in so much money and investment into some of these things like uh, like their, their the military, you know, and to compete with the United States and their economy uh, was something that the Soviet Union had a hard time actually keeping up. And they did keep up, but at a higher percentage of GDP and some of the other things that a lot of people say that the, the freedoms were, you know, lacking in, in certain ways. But again, it's about comparing to the previous state, which was, again, for the Soviet Union, it was Imperial Russia, a backwater um, uh, feudal state where, you know, being like uh, in, in the Soviet Union, these the, these conditions uh, would have seen, you know, it seemed a lot more, be a lot better than what would have happened with the generation before. That's an important point, by the way, not Bangladeshi, Kenyan or Argentinian capitalism, but American capitalism. Right. This framing itself as the competing equal of the US was a grave mistake since it immediately made the USSR seem outclassed in some regards, right. which is to be expected since the two nations started from incredibly different circumstances. Very true. A video to recommend on the issues with this point is this one, which you should check out. Uh, this was, was this the first one I covered? I covered this video. Um, I'll try to link them here at the end, but yeah, uh, this was a really good video to comment on and he brought up a lot of good points and i tried to bring up you know counterpoints from both uh, a, a capitalist and a and a uh, socialist perspective too to consider when trying to evaluate you know his thesis there but in summary leaning into the comparison narrative is wrong as basically socialist countries were besieged or otherwise artificially limited through trade embargoes sanctions or fairly direct meddling in their internal politics right a lot of people cut off trade with military Soviet overspending Union. Yes. A secondary fault, mostly of the USSR as well, defending your borders is one thing, sure. attempting to stay in parity with the US is another. Yep. 
It's completely understandable, based on Soviet historical experience, why they always maintain such a large and sophisticated military. Yeah. It's US. hard when you have to put like half of your economy into, you know, your military uh, when you have so many other needs. Again, when you're trying to grow your your state out of a feudal state and you're using it on keeping up with military technology, you know, does that is that worth it? But again, you know, people in the Soviet Union and Americans thought each other were truly an existential threat. That it was each were coming for each other. It's a Star Wars program, the electronic and computer embargo imposed on the socialist bloc, the program. formation of NATO, the list Wild. goes on and on. But in the end, this course of action did eat into the Soviet Union's ability to further improve the lives of its people and also for scientific yeah, discovery. Sure. Many of the best and brightest minds were pushed out of necessity into military development with noticeable effects. Modern research doesn't seriously indicate that Yeltsin. this is why the USSR was eventually illegally dissolved, but it definitely played a role mm. in the larger picture. It was basically my previous video. I mean, it was essentially a coup. What ends up happening there with Gelson and um, Gorbachev had uh, plenty of en enemies and not a lot of powerful friends. He was one of those guys that was stuck in the middle between you had these reformers that were saying like he wasn't doing enough. But then you had more hardcore old school communists that thought he was, you know, too reformist minded. And when you have don't have those kind of allies, it was ripe for a coup there. Oh, he's got a video on why did the Soviet Union fall? Ooh, I would like to check that out. If you guys would uh, like me to, let me know this. Why did the Soviet Union fall? I love hearing those perspectives about that. Video on why the USSR fell is a good primer into the academic literature, so check that out if you're interested. Lack of economic diversity, particularly in smaller socialist nations. True. Many smaller socialist countries, Easier said than under the advice of the USSR or on their own accord, maintained an economy with a very narrow level of diversity. Cotton. Cuba was such an example. They focus on agricultural produce, mainly sugar. Well, this this totally comes down to what the geographic distribution of resources are in your country. The bigger the country are, probably going to have more resources to be able to use, say like the Soviet Union. But this has always been such a problem for so many countries is when you get into this like mono uh, uh, like mono economy where you have like one thing, you know, you are so beholden to the global markets that it becomes very difficult. What if you're a country that pretty much your whole economy is oil? Someone like Saudi Arabia or Venezuela having problems with this. But then you have whether it's uh, <laughs> um, embargoes uh, trade embargoes like the united states has venezuela or for this uh for this for saudi arabia if you if we are become uh, moving towards um getting away from fossil fuels like what that what's that going to mean for them you know going forward of course this wasn't all encompassing but the idea was that since the socialist bloc was almost entirely allied who cares if you didn't have for example oil refining capabilities on your small island you can just get that from your ally the ussr Sophisticated meat canning industry in Uzbekistan. Unnecessary. Tajikistan has that covered. Things along those lines is my meaning. Yeah. Only recently, within the past, like, what, 30 years, has, for example, Cuba begun more heavily diversifying in light of the special period. This also somewhat applied to certain smaller Soviet republics, like the aforementioned Uzbekistan with cotton, for example. This is not a rule, however, and certain countries, for example, Bulgaria, the GDR, not to mention the USSR as a whole, Chemicals, had incredibly diverse textiles. and well developed economies. It's so interesting you're seeing these like growing textile industries when that was what the industrial revolution was built upon. So you had countries like uh, like uh, the United States or, you know, Britain, Britain especially because they were the first to industrialize and it was based off of textile industry. So you see these like countries getting into textile industry and you're talking like 200 years after the industrialization of the textile industry has taken a place in other parts of the world. It leads into the issue of Big Brother socialist countries encouraging what they consider good strategy <laughs> on other they didn't get along. Essentially, the development of self-sufficient industry and high-diversity economies coupled with narrow areas of specialization would allow for, what I personally believe to sure. be, more fraternal and equal cooperation back between to socialist labor. nations, in which every single one can nonetheless stand on their own for all basic needs. This existed in one sense in the former socialist countries, but not nearly to a sufficient extent. Likewise, this is easier said than done. Paul Cockshot's How the World Works Towards the End has some interesting writing on this. Hmm. Okay. Not enough light industry. Is that cologne? <laughs> An issue that arose right from the start of the USSR was the heavy divide industry. between heavy and light industry. That was Stalin's heavy industry thing. lends very well to the immediate needs of the nation as a whole, allowing for the production of heavy machinery, steel and iron, resources for infrastructure development, building materials, and of course, military technology. And that makes sense. Heavy machinery is such a basis for so many things. 
right? Like making machines to make machines. So you make big machines to make little machines and then little machines can make little things. You know what I mean? So it kind of made sense how much they invested in that. When you saw that in the five-year plans from Stalin, that was such a big thing. It was uh, heavy machinery and then of course agriculture. Um, but then you got to diversify, right? You got to, yeah, get into smaller stuff, especially if you want anything that might be close to being considered consumer goods because that's where the united states also makes so much money is on consumer goods little things that people don't even necessarily need for survival but if you do have expendable income you buy it because it's fun or enjoyable or whatever this is what's required to for example develop housing roads hospitals a strong military and almost everything else required on a national level light industry on the other hand is what's necessary for our needs as individuals mostly Wood products, simple home appliances, textiles, all sorts of food products, cleaning products, things for personal hygiene, amongst many other things. I'm <laughs> reminded Russian of an song. old Soviet professor that said to her students, you complain that we produce Sputniks and not lingerie. Now, this sentiment is misplaced, though, as the USSR did in fact produce lingerie. <laughs> though, this in essence is the divide. Although all of us can explicitly admit that the conquering of space and the development of national infrastructure is what's best, we can't ignore the fact that for many, happiness is in the small things. Well, one thing that was interesting, though, about developing, you know, space technology and stuff is that that technology was also used to make other goods. Uh, for example, some of the technology used for space travel and communicating was also um, then used for like the development of like televisions. So it, you can get like a, a positive economic byproduct from some of these investments. Beauty creams, toasters and variety in textiles have a much larger impact on the satisfaction of a population than the fact that we built a new dam or that we have taken images of the far side of our galaxy. In the hindsight, the Soviet strategy of focusing though. on heavy industry was right, as, for example, Bukharin's emphasis on light industry would have resulted in a Soviet Union with a much weaker capacity to firstly absorb the German invasion and secondly to carry the war to victory. Had the Soviet leadership not emphasized heavy industry, you and I may be speaking German right now, and also <laughs> dead, because we're lefty Asiatics. <laughs> Despite that fact, that yeah, very heavy machinery did come in, you know, come into play there. They, they, there was a lot of United States intervention with a lot of those um, heavy machinery of war. Put that alongside the, you know, Soviet production, then you saw the victory, right? Emphasis on heavy industry and a relatively smaller emphasis on light industry resulted in some level of discontent among certain sectors of the Soviet population. In fact, many people who had a problem with Soviet society complained of primarily one thing. Lack of variety or quality in consumer goods. Right. Humans are strange creatures. This, of course, was the strategy of the USSR and hence was imported without much thought to many socialist nations, resulting in similar shortages or inadequacies of consumer goods and a surplus of heavy industry in some countries like Romania or Poland. Mm, yeah. The book Soviet Consumer Culture in the Brezhnev Era is decent when read with a critical eye, oh, so interesting. check it out. There's I would say that a lot of people refer to the kind of the 70s Brezhnev Era you know, as a, as maybe one of the most positive times for the Soviet Union. Um, and so seeing actually, yeah, that there was some kind of consumer culture there, especially as compared to like before that era when there was little to none, especially under the Stalin era uh, with that. But again, you're talking about a slow, I guess, a slow development in starting from the beginning, like you're saying with heavy machinery, like you got to start with that. And then you hope to break into, again, consumer goods. Um, but then we're going to have to see what the problems are when it's, you know, you come into the 1980s, like after the Brezhnev era, when you still had economic problems. There's also some writing on Yugoslav consumer we'll culture, which was very different comparatively, but that's an entirely different conversation. Back to the video in just a second. Let's hear from today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. For a lot of research that I do for my videos, I end up hitting pages that aren't available in my location. That's frustrating, as you can imagine. Geo-restriction really does suck, but not with Atlas VPN. From, uh, for those Iraq, out there, right? a virtual private network makes all of your internet traffic travel through an encrypted tunnel. This way, it protects you from spying, public Wi-Fi dangers, and hides your IP address and your online activities. It even allows you to change your location for all your researching needs. Developed by top cybersecurity specialists and IT engineers in 2019, Atlas VPN was created to make the internet accessible and secure for everybody. Currently, it has more than 6 million users worldwide and boasts the best VPN deal on the market with the most affordable online protection plan for just under $2 per month, if you can believe it, with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So, what are you waiting for? Go down to the description and click that link and use my code Hakeem to get a 3-year subscription for just $183 a month with 3 months free. 
But that's not all. You get blazing fast speeds for streaming or gaming, unlimited protection for all your devices, an inbuilt ad and malware blocker, and you'll get to save some extra cash as Atlas VPN will find you the best deals online from everything from your online subscriptions to airlines, hotels, and more. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount. It means you can get a three-year subscription for just $183 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Time is running out, so get your deal by clicking the link in the video description below. Massive thanks to Atlas VPN for the sponsorship. This is what allows me to pay my editor fairly, so the support is highly appreciated. All right, back to the video. Not enough democratic participation. Mm. Of course, the modern bourgeois pedal notion that there is no democracy in the form of socialist experiments is blatantly false. Modern research, what the CIA actually believes, as well as what the Soviets said all along, turned out to be unsurprisingly true. There was democracy of a different kind, a proletarian democracy, which resulted in societies far more participatory than any Western liberal democracy. Cuba is a living example of said socialist democracy. Regardless, just because the Soviet Union... I know a lot of you are probably typing right now about this, like those weren't, you know, democratic systems and things. I recently was kind of getting down a rabbit hole a little bit of um, some of the like policies, democracy in, in communist states. And it seemed like there was such a big problem in, in the interpretations. When you go back to like, like Marxist idea of dictatorship of the proletariat which seems like some people were, were claiming it's like it's oxymoronic. And like you look at like the Trotsky perspective to have something like that, like a dictatorship, how can I have that? But it's OK if it's a dictatorship because it's the proletariat. It's the working class. Um, but then does that then, you know, what does that do for the bourgeoisie, especially in a time where you haven't achieved socialism, where you still have the you know, you're still in that transitionary state, like how democratic was it? And it seemed like when it came into practice, all these different you know places that were practicing this all had different ideas of what democratic participation was and it should be. And it split people and it actually became violent, you know, in a case like Trotsky. Um, so. Yeah. In order, the GDR was more politically participatory than the US, a fact only those blind to ideology deny, does not mean that those nations were without fault. There was definitely more room for workplace democracy, as the state it was in in the USSR was relatively underdeveloped and unsatisfactory for to be, socialist expectations. That was supposed to be with the basis of all this was eventually supposed to be is a democratization of the workplace, right? Um, it, with the economic system for, for socialism being that the workers own and operate the means of productions, not just the bourgeoisie uh, uh, capitalist class. So I don't know, like, where do you where are you supposed to start this, like more democracy of the workplace or more democracy of the state in its transitionary process to, you know, eventually get rid of the state? If you are one that even believed that that should be the goal is the elimination of the state to do the, the classic definition of communism with uh, being stateless, moneyless and classless. It seemed like that's where it got so divisive uh, over different times at different places. What does that final thing look like? But it does everyone agree on the final product but you know also the all the different paths that it, that you can take to hopefully get there the system of trade union representation was not as independent as one would hope and there were way too many rubber stamping committees to sure be the comfortable. state takes over all the this trade arose unions. from this or that necessity but it's something to learn to avoid in the future on the other hand most of the issues i currently have with soviet political democracy have been pretty much corrected or are in the process of being corrected in cuba Great books on this topic include Cuba and its Neighbors, Democracy in Motion by Arnold August, and How the Workers' Parliament Saved the Cuban Revolution by Pedro Ross. It is really good that he brings in so many sources. He does seem very well read in um, these different you know, pieces of work and, and research, whatever, from socialist perspectives. Uh, but yeah, that you can like go and you know look at those things. Some may feel the existence of only a single party, as well as democratic centralism, are likewise issues. I personally disagree, and several socialist examples had multi-party democracy as well, but I'm only mentioning these for posterity's sake. Yeah, because on like you had some that believed that there still should be multiple parties, um, but a lot of people thought that's just going to create like social inequality. But like, how can you be de democratic if everyone's forced into voting for one party? But then also like, well, what if that party does actually represent the needs of the proletariat and actually is chosen from the proletariat? This is where I, I've always s seen things get really messy in this cultural expression. Mm. This is a particularly severe point. Considering the USSR, there was a strong drive so at first for local cultural expression, the yeah. development of local languages, the maintenance of local traditions, and religions amongst other things. Eastern European Around countries, the mid-30s, though, countries. a subtle change occurred, with local language scripts being changed to Cyrillic, for example. Not that big of a deal, but still not ideal. 
the biggest change well, occurred. It, it's a big deal if if you're you feel like you're being you know language is such a huge part of culture. So if you are you know having yours uprooted or replaced or something, I think that is where some people would uh, you know have problems with. Okay, we got to get Brezhnev off the screen. He was of era and onwards. Passive Russification <laughs> took place in that there was never any active repression of a particular ethnicity outside of World War II-era deportations, which likewise were mistaken. But in order to climb higher in life, as well as through the dissemination of Russian culture throughout the republics, many mastered Russian instead of their native tongues, adopted Russian traditions, started naming right. their children Russian names, and for all intents and purposes became Russian. This, combined with the moving the of Russian issue technical too. experts into the smaller republics, spread some level of discontent and directly contributed to the reactionary petty nationalisms of non-Russian ethnicities towards the end of the USSR. Do you think this is something the Soviet Union underestimated? That thinking that people would be okay with creating this like monoculture, but with it being inspired by so much Russian culture, but that do they you think they thought that that like people were going to be like, yeah, fine, we'll give up language, religion, um, these sort of things. It, maybe they did. This reached its tip when in Kazakhstan, Kazakhs not only became a minority in their own republic, but the central committee of the Kazakh branch of the Communist Party had not a single Kazakh on it. I don't think I need to explain mm. how grave of a mistake this was. People hate that, In my man, personal opinion, this was one of the worst, most easily avoided mistakes of the USSR. Yeah. In another vein, Albania also had incredibly strange and unnecessarily repressive limits on cultural expression. An example of this would be the Albania name list, the official thing, list of though. first names you can name your child, which were supposedly neutral, purely Albanian names. Mild repression hit Christian names, or so-called Christian names, but the blunt of the repression, similar with every other aspect in Albania, hit the Muslim population. Right. People with traditionally Islamic names were Islamic forced to dominated. change their names to neutral Albanian, or ironically, and I believe somewhat intentionally, to Christian ones. This was absolutely unnecessary and is honestly really, really stupid. There are other examples of this sort of thing. Bulgaria comes to mind, but you get the point. So is Akeem one that, that kind of views religion as more important than, say, this idea that it's a, um, you know, opium of the masses and opiate of the masses, but say it's something that still, you know, can be practiced in these societies? This was... Because I know that is, that's, you know, very disagreed upon, too, by a lot of people that want to, whether you, you consider it going, like, full into socialism or not... Um, the idea of what religion plays. It also seems to be one of those vastly disagreeing things that I see historically. Repression of religious practice. There Building up from the previous point, the severe repression of religious expressions was one of the, if not the worst mistake of former socialist experiments. Okay. So I religion can see where and spirituality at. are something that will always remain in one way or another, particularly in historically That's religious communities. Look at that mix there, though, because you have this like Western European architecture, then you have um, the Islamic writings. It's like it could be a mosque. It looks like this was like a, a like a mosque, but then also it was like once a palace. <laughs> communities, religious what is that communities site, of all types, way? survived and adapted from slave societies to feudal or other pre-capitalist formations through capitalism, and will definitely endure in one way or another during socialism and eventually, possibly even communism. For a socialist government to not only deny public religious expression of any kind, but to also actively repress it with militant atheist gangs wandering the countryside, yes, this happened, and active <laughs> anti-religious education yeah. in schools only lends reactionary forces power. Religion is an incredibly powerful I love that tool. Hindu and Hindu stuff, man. I love like the, the Hindu architecture with their artwork. Look at look at every little piece of architecture on here. So meticulous. So cool. Every religious tradition lends itself very well to socialist ideals if you try. If one were intelligent, they'd rather utilize religion as a driving force for participation in social society oh. and wield it as a weapon against other sorts of reaction. If you don't do that, what ends up happening is that this tool will fall into the hands of reactionary forces who are highly motivated, usually well armed and supported by foreign powers, to undermine the power of the socialist state. True. That and yeah, also if, your massive if your enemies are, you know, people that believe very much in religious expression, especially certain types of religious uh, uh, um, expression. So if you're like the United States, for example, as like a Christian state, whether you agree with that or not, <laughs> but uh, like the oppression of Christians in a place that is already not looked upon kindly because they may be uh, a socialist state is going to create an ally for your enemies inside of your own state, like with the Soviet Union, you know? Discontent amongst religious populations. An often ignored aspect for local discontent in the, for example, Central Asian republics was this very issue, and directly yeah. aided those espousing petty nationalisms with calls for us being able to practice our own religion in our own country, finally. Yeah. I've heard too many stories from people I know having to secretly baptize their children, 
or people having to hide religious texts and false walls and secret pits in fear right. of authorities. Push it on My own ground. father, who studied many years in the USSR on a trip to Azerbaijan, had people follow him to his hotel room begging him to teach them how to recite the Quran properly. This is not what socialism should stand for and is definitely something that deserves right, so the most his severe condemnation. Mm. If you want humanity, the vast majority of which is religious in one form or another, behind your political cause, you need to have a coherent and positive religious strategy. Don't forget the reason many Muslims supported the Bolsheviks early on. Is this another on. thing that early Soviet communists also are underestimated was how big the resistance would be for religious change and, and really driving religion underground, if not trying to extinct it? Seems like that as well, huh? It's like it, it just thought that people would just would bury it and, and not see a need for it and see their perspective that it's some you know tool of the bourgeoisie. Um, and that adopting socialist policies would fill that void or whatever that people feel they need that religion is supposed to fill. ...is because they promise they defend their mosques and right to worship. Want to know the best part? After nearly a century of unrelenting state atheism, socialism died and religion sprung up again as if it never disappeared. The errors of that strategy like are which one crystal won. clear. It's a good point. The deportations. Ah... Uh. Another severe point of criticism, although really only affected one country, this happened in the USSR during the German invasion with a select group of nationalities. The idea being that certain reactionary sections of said populations either collaborated with the Germans, were planning on collaborating, or were under suspicion of collaborating. Now, for the actions of a few hundred of a certain population, tens of thousands were forcibly deported to other areas of the USSR. These actions were not done based on material analysis, nor were these actions absolutely necessary. The only somewhat saving grace, if you can even term it so, is the sheer barbarity of that war necessitating such actions. But still, the lesson for the future is very clear. A correct and socialist assessment of a similar situation in the future should Are result in a very different course of action. A book with a sobering take on this ordeal is Stalin, the History and Critique of a Black Legend by Domenico Lucerto, which I highly recommend you read. Hmm. The Purges. <laughs> now, the purges are such an incredibly I wonder. topic, and I won't go into all the complexities right now. Suffice to say, though, the common image of the purges in the West is very, very wrong. They were not the actions of some totalitarian godman in order to consolidate power. Are they going to do the thing? Uh, this is a famous photo where there's another photo of um, the guy next to him being omitted from this picture. Or, or any other of their favorite tropes. Purged. The reality of the purges was, in fact, way worse. Essentially, a fifth column existed within the Soviet Union, and it attempted to bring down the Soviet government and basically install a military dictatorship in support of Germany. Unsurprisingly, this fifth column was supported by Germany, as well as many other elements outside the USSR. The real failure on the part of the Soviet leadership was allowing a fifth column such as this to form in the first place. Not only that, but the extent of its influence was so far that it controlled vital aspects of the military, the internal security apparatus, and even the party. The very existence of this means horrible mistakes and oversights were done. Certain people were either protected from suspicion for some period or simply the party was nearly vigilant enough in screening its members, in particular those with vital positions. This same Wait, 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 wait. Is he saying pro purge at that time with with um under Stalin? So Stalin purged about half of the military leadership of the Soviet Union. And here in this perspective is is a little bit newer to me that he's saying it's because they were um, they were allies or supportive uh, and supported by the Germans. And that's why they were purged rather than being some kind of like ex existential threat to his own power. Um, as he saw the, the, the military as a potential usurper of power, um, somebody that or uh, come from the group that could, you know, take him out or deviate the plan that Stalin had for the Soviet Union going forward. I hadn't heard this take um, that the purge for the military was actually because of uh, German loyalty. Um, let me know a little bit more about where maybe I can learn more about that as well. You know, analyze his take. Uh, let's see some comments. Issue reared its head towards the end of the USSR as well. When, not so much of a fifth column, but definitely an anti-Soviet and anti-socialist group managed to form, grow and eventually occupy vital positions within the government, the prime example being Yeltsin. Paradoxically, yes. active purges are good at weeding out these elements and were done since Lenin's time. How you can combine active purges with significant vigilance such that no issues like in the 30s rise again, I don't know, though. Check out the book mentioned previously for a deeper dive as well as J.R. Getty's work.
That seems also look up what the purge is like quite okay. Looks like he's done with the purge section, but I was gonna say a, a very interesting take. Um, a, it, he did not speak about what I thought he would, um, with purges, so that's uh interesting during lens time. Were that was actually what most purge. Also, look up what the purges during lens time were. That was actually what most purges throughout Soviet history were like. And I was referring more to the limitations of obviously the uh Stalin era ones. Planning. Okay, limitations Visit and planning throughout Soviet history were like. Limitations of planning. This is a minor point that has far-reaching consequences. In the USSR and many other socialist countries, planning was done by complex calculations carried out by hand, which meant that it would take a long time to develop plans of a sophisticated level. Because of these right. limitations, at most, He's only 10,000 different plans. units within the economy were planned for in the USSR. This amount is laughable nowadays, as a regular smartphone can plan for many times that, and modern supercomputers can plan unfathomably complex multi-year plans for entire <laughs> nations. The issue is that, even with the development of computers, the Soviet Union stuck to small-scale planning and later on broke up the central planning committees into many regional planning committees with non-binding plans, essentially becoming directives that technically didn't have to be followed. This well, happened even though it wasn't the idea for some of that too, was to give more decision-making processes to the localities rather than just being hold state planning that way because that had you know they'd done that for so long and slowly that gets eroded away a little bit because they thought it was less efficient they needed to give more decision making power to different localities and the people that work there and the people that organize there um, which you know i guess a lot would say is a lot more socialist in in giving more power to the workers and the people that the workers more directly choose to be their leaders Though revolutionary new methods for planning with the limitations of the time had taken place, for example with Project Cybersyn in Allende's Chile. In fact, Chile's Cybersyn project was only a small-scale imagining of Glushkov's OGAS system. This system was to essentially be an internet system that spanned the entire territory of the Soviet Union and would have radically eased as well as developed the planning capacity of the USSR. Not only this, but it would have most likely developed into a civilian internet network for the spread of information much like the modern internet. However, we are talking about the 1960s here. It never happened, partly due to an ossified bureaucracy, but also due to the sheer cost. Hindsight is 2020, after all. But sure. I'm convinced that had OGAS been adopted, not only would the USSR still exist today, it would have surpassed the US as the largest economy on Earth even sooner than predicted. Really? Based on 1980s numbers, the USSR was going to be the number one economic power by the early 21st century. A good video on this topic is this one. Likewise, a deep dive into the economic calculation problem nonsense can be found here. Interesting. I have to look at, you know, I guess those, those stats. But uh, I didn't see in, in that. Maybe I need to go back. Was it comparing? I mean, growth rates are one thing, but also you have different s starting points. If you were to compare rates, you know, growth rates from like the United States or Soviet Union, that's not usually an indicator necessarily of of uh, comparing the the economic wealth and power of a country. But you can see a lot of growth, especially if you started in a lower position and seeing that. Uh, you would definitely have seen that with that the Soviet had Union. been adopted, not only would the USSR still exist today, it would have surpassed the US as the largest economy on Earth even sooner than predicted. Based on 1980s numbers, the USSR was going to be the number one economic power by the early 21st century. A good video on this topic is this one. Likewise, a deep dive into the economic calculation problem nonsense can be found here. Okay. Transitioning to a profit-based enterprise system. Uh, Among the many mistakes of Khrushchev and the Soviet administration at the time, which included regional planning committees and the selling off of the machine and tractor stations to collective farms, is the transition of Soviet enterprises to a profit-based system in order to measure productivity. Now, Khrushchev was a response to Stalin-era policies as well. De-Stalinization was, was intentional, at least they believe, Khrushchev and his supporters believed, as the things that were going wrong at that time. And maybe a more liberalization of the economy was something that they felt was needed um, after the Stalin economic years. So that would have gone into the decision making process of why they did make those changes. So if you're saying that, you know, they shouldn't have done those, um, that would be interesting to look at to see if continuing some of those policies would actually have been more beneficial. Rather than output, quality or relative performance to economic plans. This created a precedent for profit over more valid criteria in certain sectors of the economy, incentivized the hiring and maintenance of managers that got the most profit and hence cultivated a capitalist mindset amongst Soviet managerial sectors. Unsurprisingly, Yeltsin was climbing the ranks during this crucial period. Two good books True. to read with a critical eye on this topic include Bill Bland's Restoration of Capitalism in the Soviet Union and Martin Nicholas's book of the same name. Hmm. Cockshaw too, again, unsurprisingly. The Ossification of Party Leadership 
Somewhat linked to the previous point, the ossification of Soviet leadership was a grave error. The average age of members of the Central were Committee old, primarily man. was uncomfortably high. Similarly, although to a lesser extent, Career this issue was man. also present with members of the Supreme Soviet. This is a self-explanatory point. A more frequent rotation of leadership at most levels, an age limit, and a higher percentage of the young can only do good for socialist political structures, in my mm. opinion. They were too old. The common turn. I mean, most people agree with that. You look in like American politics, how people have very much felt strongly that having these old candidates just circulate is not, at the, at the very least, just not inspiring or exciting for voters. Another very complicated point, but one I can go over quickly. Common turn. The idea of coordinating party work and strategy across nations is an incredibly attractive one, but it suffers Difficult. from several flaws. One dominant socialist nation might, well, dominate the strategy. An example of the USSR, for example, and will unsurprisingly result in some bad decisions. An example of said decision is the strange coordination of the Chinese Revolution. Such mm -hmm. issues, as well as the post-war period in general, cause the common turn to be Different abolished. Context, though. Ideally, for the future, a more, let's say, horizontal form of organization can be built up, where a panel of socialist nations and parties switch out leadership and organization. This has many flaws as well, but is just an idea I'm throwing out there. Okay. Over bureaucratization. Unsurprisingly, a, a massive nation such as the USSR needed some level of bureaucracy. This is something all transitionary and socialist nations require for effective organization. Do you think? Do you guys think the Soviet Union ever truly considered itself transitionary in, in the in the in the sense that the things that they're putting in were very much designed to not exist eventually? All these protocols that come from the state and the power of the state, or do you feel like that was? what they felt like, like was receiving that. So the end state is communism, right? That they ever thought that, that they would get there. Or is it just something that you talked about, but you're like the processes we do now are what we're going to be doing, you know, maybe forever. You think that was, I don't know if I'm explaining that right, but do you really, do you really think that, that, that they were, they consider themselves in a, you know, consider themselves in a transitionary period, but do you feel like they ever thought they would get out of it or the things they were doing were actually putting them on a path to eliminating, again, the state? But that at the end ever of the day, there are too many bureaucrats, inefficiencies occur, and a hardened crust of them will make dynamic change more difficult. In line with Lenin's awkwardly titled, Better Fewer But Better, these solutions are, well, essentially, better fewer but better. Many of the form issues that existed can be fixed with modern computing, but nonetheless, this is something we need to consider. The Sovietization of Socialist Experience Basically what it sounds like. Almost all the issues mentioned resulted from the USSR poking in the dark for solutions as they were the first to try. Yeah. Many countries Everyone followed in the first steps even when the decisions were wrong for said countries or wrong in general. A critical re-evaluation of all things the USSR did should be done before any course of action is drawn up. And, and the only way I think you could have done that if you're the Soviet Union is if all of these different places that they are, you know, are hoping will adopt uh, this this socialist framework are all coming from the same backgrounds, which they're just not, right? They're just not. And if they want a lot of, if they if they would have wanted, you know, powerful states that still had capital systems before that weren't necessarily just these products of exploitation of imperialism, which is, you know, what happened in a lot of these states that do adopt it. But like, how would you know adopting the so the the Soviet model? How could that ever be something that could work for everybody? There are many other criticisms to be made, but this video is getting long enough. If I didn't mention something you want to hear, either this video has dragged on long enough, or because it isn't really something to criticize. I, I agree with him here. Maybe, possibly, I missed it, who knows. There are a few books I can recommend, of course, the first and foremost being Parentes, Black Shirts and Reds, which you have to read, it discusses many other issues I haven't even touched. For more detailed analysis on which flaws contributed to the illegal dissolution of the USSR, take a look at the book Socialism Betrayed and my relevant video on the topic. An interesting, interesting but old book on the, the early propaganda war, as well as all other sorts of sabotage and antagonism against the USSR, is The Great Conspiracy from 1946. A quick Google search will bring you the PDF. As for Soviet democracy, you can look up Pat Sloan's Soviet Democracy. Anything written by Albert Szymanski, for example, is The Red Flag Flying or Human Rights in the USSR. Uh, Webb's book called Soviet Communism and New Civilization, or an old book titled The Soviet Form of Popular Government, which explains it at a nicely detailed level. As for planning and cybernetics, look up Cockshot's work, obviously, for example, Towards New Socialism, and Medina's book titled Cybernetic a lot of, Revolutionaries. Uh, stuff you can look at, huh? That's enough for now. If you enjoy what I do, then please consider supporting me on Patreon. Really. All right, final thoughts. 
All right, if you're somebody that has been commenting on these videos that I've been covering about Hakeem, and, and if you've really been uh, like criticizing Hakeem's perspectives, you probably agree with everything he just said there. Uh, the one I'm still, and maybe I got to watch it again, was a little bit more about what he thought of purges and the usefulness of them and how the, like, and, what they were actually in response to but i would think at least other than that most of you that again are critical of, of socialism in general would probably agree with most everything he said and probably use that you probably use that in your arguments to say why well those are the reasons that socialism is at fault where he's saying like you know those those things that he did are not core tenets of socialism they don't need to exist Right. But then some people say, well, they're just that's just par for the course. That's what they all do and they will all lead to. And that's, I guess, where people are going to be disagreeing upon and uh, where that conversation, I guess, lies right now in that political discourse. So anyways, interesting to, to look at that. Um, and thanks again for everyone that has been kind of following. I guess you could call this this series of covering these Akeem videos. Let me know if you want me to uh, check out again another video and specifically which ones come over to the discord server. It's the best place to drop those links uh one i would be interested probably in checking out if you guys let me know would be that fall of the soviet union thing i'd like to hear his take um about it and why it failed and and whatever conspiracies he believes were at, at fault there um i would be interested in checking that but i only want to do it if you want to watch it and uh, follow along with me all right with that we'll see you all next time bye